if someone came up to you and said, can I have all the money in your wallet? Mm -hmm. You'd say, if, providing they don't have a gun. Right. You would say, no, get away from me. Right. That's but right. if somebody says, can I touch your body in places that will be exciting to me and maybe awful for you? Yeah. All of a sudden, I have to worry about their feelings? Bum, 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 sex ed, sex ed. What's happening in your bed? We've got answers just ahead. Yeah, it's time for Sex Ed, the musical. Hello, and welcome to Sex Ed, the musical. I'm your host, Wendy Miller, coming to you from Studio 3A. Today's episode is all about consent. Many years ago, I was at a party at the Playboy Mansion. That, uh, by the way, that is the douchiest way to start a story, so congrats to me. But it's true, I was at the Playboy Mansion, and I'd been producing shows for Playboy for about a year at this point, and one of the people I'd worked with a lot was adult star slash registered nurse slash sex educator, Nina Hartley. Nina Hartley and I became friends. We'd hang out on set. We actually went to her house. She gave us a tour of her dungeon. It's a really, really nice dungeon. I highly recommend it if you have dinner at Nina Hartley's house. Anyway, we were kind of pally. So we're at the Playboy Mansion, and it's super glam. There's celebrities that would actually show up for us there. And there's big screens, and there's stages, and there's live music, and gourmet corn dogs. It's a really big night. And Nina Hartley walks up to me, and she goes, Would it be okay if we made out and I felt you up for a minute? Uh, you know, listen, hey, I'm a swinging, sophisticated chick, right? I've been working at Playboy for a year. Come on, this kind of stuff comes my way all the time, right? So when she says that to me, I immediately start laughing uncontrollably. I'm sorry, it was embarrassing, and I really wasn't, you know, prepared for that. And she's looking at me like I'm an idiot, because clearly I am an idiot. And I'm trying to backpedal, and I'm trying to be groovy. And literally, with every, every, every word I'm saying, she's stepping backwards. You know, this is, not, this is not her first rodeo, and clearly I'm an idiot, and I'm not nearly as cool as I had at least fooled her into thinking I was. She's like, okay, no problem. She walks away. And then I'm like, oh, shit. Did I just totally offend Nina Hartley? And so Jamie Waxman, of all people, walks up. She's a sex expert. I hope to have her on the show at some point. And I go, Jamie, Jamie, I have to ask you something. Um, and I also, I, full disclosure, I'm also kind of bragging at this point. I go, um, Nina Hartley just totally hit on me. And I said, no, thanks. And I'm just afraid I offended her. Because, you know, as women, we always have to manage everyone else's feelings. And Jamie looks at me and says, well, she's a swinger. She's in the lifestyle. You didn't offend her. I'm sure it's fine. And I went, oh, okay, good, 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 good. And then she walked away and I kind of, I probably had a gourmet corn dog and, you know, reflected on my life as one does at the Playboy Mansion after being hit on by a famous porn star slash registered nurse slash sex educator. But what Nina Hartley was practicing was consent. And that's the funny thing about my job at Playboy People probably thought it was nonstop sexapalooza, but honestly, I was safer at Playboy TV and more respected at Playboy TV than anywhere else I worked. And there are two reasons for that. First of all, you have to pass a very vigorous background check so that weeds out all the creepers. That's great. And secondly, professional sex havers have a code of honor, a list of rules that they follow. And one of those things is always getting consent. And I try to say to my friends who think, well, I don't want to go to a swinger party. I'm going to be mauled by everyone. You're actually safer at a swinger party than you are in a bar. Because at a swinger party, people generally ask consent and no means no. So when I said no to Nina Hartley, very clumsily and stupidly and embarrassingly on my part, she knew to back off and it was never mentioned again. My guest today, Dr. Jennifer Lang, is about as accomplished as humanly possible She's the founder and creator of Buzz Labs, a social impact tech startup, innovating products to end sexual violence. She practiced as a board-certified OBGYN and gynecologic oncologist specializing in minimally invasive and robotic surgery. She also co-founded an international medical nonprofit that has grown to support 80 clinics spanning Africa, Asia, the Caribbean, and Central America, all about curing cervical cancer. She's the mother of three children, two of which she gave birth to in her own bathtub at home, and the author of the book we're going to discuss today, Consent, The New Rules for Sex Education and Every Teen's Guide to Healthy Sexual Relationships. 
This book is aimed at 13 to 25 year olds, and it addresses a very scary subject matter for parents like me and probably you. But one, once we can get out of our own way, that's incredibly important. Sit back, relax. Here's our special guest. When you read sex education information, there is an assumption of abstinence. Your book makes the assumption that kids are sexually active, but it's all framed very much as if, look, it's going to happen because it is going to happen. It is happening. Yeah. If we look at just the numbers, you know, and I address this directly because when I have a fact versus fiction kind of section and one of them is, you know, everybody's doing it. Right. And, you know, the truth is about 70% of kids before they graduate will be sexually active. I, I think so, you said the average age was 16. Is that what it was? Right. It's, it's really the summer after your junior year. It's like the big time. But there's still 30% that aren't. So I, if you're not sexually active, you know, I don't want to perpetuate this myth that everybody's doing it. 30% is not insignificant. So I really wrote the book. I don't want to make any assumptions. It's, it's, there's a huge um, range of what is healthy and normal. And I just want, you know, young people to understand like having sexual feelings, totally normal. Uh, in, embarking on this like discovery, totally normal and wonderful as long as it begins with the consent conversation. Girls are basically raised where we are the gatekeepers. We are the ones who decide if boys are going to have sex. All the pressure is put on us. Don't let them go all the way. Don't let them do this. Mm -hmm. Like all of the pressure is put on girls. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about how that affects girls moving forward and what kind of pressure that is and if that's a realistic way to grow up? Well, I think it's a completely unfair way to grow up. And um, and I want to be part of the conversation that helps to change that. But you're absolutely right. That is the messaging that girls are given. And, you know, we're, we're using these terms, girls, guys. But I just want to be clear. I wrote this book for all genders, all gender identities, all orientations. And I don't want to make it sound like one is, you know, privileged over the other. That being said, you know, the majority of the cases we're going to be discussing are, you know, male, female. But it is important to talk to whatever, if you have a trans kid, if you have a non-binary kid, it's very important that every kid needs sex education, regardless of whose parts are interested in what parts that they have. Completely agree with that. Yeah. And, and we need to make the language of that sex education, open, inclusive, welcoming, positive, you know, where no one feels shamed if they don't fit into whatever box people want to put them in. Anyway, you're completely right that girls from the youngest ages are raised with this, I mean, right now, kind of impossible double standard, right? Because on one hand, they are sexualized so early, right? right? Images in the media, I mean, high heels for elementary school children, all of that. So they're being bombarded with sexualized images of female sexuality and yet also told that if they participate freely, they will get slut shamed, um, be attractive to others, but don't act on that, you know, be uh, desirable, but don't give in, you know, set, set the limits. I have, I have a friend who's got a 12 year old daughter and, um, Her daughter came home from school the other day and said, a bunch of boys were calling a girl a slut Mm -hmm. and a whore. Yeah. What do those words mean? Yeah. And I said to her, if if my daughter asked me that question, I would say those are words to demean girls, actually. Mm -hmm. That's exactly what they are. Yeah. Because you don't use that language for cisgender boys. In fact, all of those those terms would be considered positives. You know, oh, he's a player. He's right. a he's a baller. You right. know, he's like. So it's funny. I mean, just to take us way back to my childhood, <laughs> I have always loved to dance. And when I was seven, I went off to this summer camp for the month of July, my first year at this summer camp, and they had dances where it was a girls' camp and a boys' camp, and we get together for dances, and um. I started dancing and people at seven, I started hearing slut, slut, slut. Could you, you can't even imagine, you know? So anyway, you're right. It's an impossible double standard. Girls should not be the gatekeepers. This needs to be a conversation that happens on all sides and a mutual responsibility. And I think that framing it this way, that girls are the 
uh, givers of permission, boys right. are the seekers of right. action, is actually harmful to all genders because boys believe that they are expected to act that way, whether or not that's what they really genuinely want. So, you know, in my book, I talk about sorting through the internal and the external pressures to really get in, dial in to what you really want. When is a good time to start talking to your kids about consent? And I've seen things where it's like, don't make them hug grandma. Don't make them give a kiss to weird Uncle Louie. You know, it's like <laughs> all of these things are telling them totally that they are not in charge of their own bodies and sending them mixed messages. So when is it an okay time to start talking to your kids about consent? Um, it's a great question and funny point because I married an uh, Italian American guy who's always, you know, give the kiss to, you know, aunt, whoever. And I said, no, no, no. (laughs) And now he is on board. Like he understands why when we tell a child that they have to do something with their bodies or give access to their bodies in a way that they don't want, and that that's what the parental expectation is for them to just put their own, you know, physical body autonomy aside and do as told, that's very damaging. What are some more examples of that? Things that you would say to your kids that could potentially be damaging? Mandatory hugs and kisses to family members is a big one. Uh, You know, go sit on Santa's lap. I'm taking this picture. Obviously, when we have toddlers, sometimes we need to have them do things with their bodies that they may not want to do. But um, I think it begins from the very earliest ages. And I think it's uh, I would not recommend waiting till they're in, you know, middle school to have the talk. I did this, uh, I put a Facebook post up a couple weeks ago. We were driving to school and I had my three kids in the back seat and they were having a fight because my son wanted to show a magic trick to his younger sister. And she said, I don't want to see your magic trick. He's like, but you said you wanted to be, see my magic trick. You have to see my magic trick. She's like, I don't want to see it. And mom, mom, he's like, sorry, Nico, you can't force her to watch. She gets to change her mind, you know? So, and, and that I, I posted it because I wanted parents to see, like, we're having these conversations all the time. They don't have to be specifically about sex. They can just be about like somebody having the right to change their mind, to agree to one thing that's not a blanket consent for everything else, you know, and we always have to be in conversation. And that is the main point that I think most adults don't even understand is that consent is not a contract that you sign at one dated time stamped moment. It is a fluid, ongoing, evolving conversation that can ebb and flow, reverse directions, pause, resume, and it needs to be seen that way. But what if you want to get them to get in the fucking bathtub? (laughs) There are certain things that I make my kid do that I don't, I know she doesn't want to do. Yeah. So you, you want to make them feel, okay, you are autonomous. You have full agency, but get your butt in the bathtub. Yeah. And you know, dinner table, eating your vegetables. It's like the same thing. Like there are some things as parents that it really is our job, you know, and my, my seven-year-old daughter will test me on this because she knows this is a, a, a button issue for me. She'll be like, but I'm the boss of my body. You can't make me eat that broccoli. Like, but I'm your mother and my job is to keep your body safe and healthy and you will eat that broccoli. <laughs> but that's a slippery slope because anyone can use that argument. I'm your mother. Do as I say. Go hug grandma. Like yeah. She's got hair coming out of her chin. Go hug grandma. Here's the thing. I don't mind if kids, particularly girls, are so empowered that they're going to start debating with adults about body autonomy. Amen. Yeah. Like, please bring it. Yeah. That's what I want. Yes. That's what I want. My my daughter was about uh, seven years old. And she said to me, what do you want me to be when I grow up? And I said, I want you to be a badass. Yes. And she said, isn't that a bad word? I said, it is, but not in this context. Excellent. So it's like whenever she negotiates with me, mm-hmm. whenever she pushes back, I'm thrilled because girls have a tendency to not want to cause trouble and are socialized to put themselves last and Mm -hmm. to not make waves. How old are your kids again? So eldest daughter, 10, middle son, 9, youngest daughter, 7. 
Are you speaking to them differently about sex education and consent? I think there are some things that I'll say to the 10-year-old that I might not say to the 7-year-old. Um, but just like you, you know, I, if they ask me a question, I will answer directly, you know, with complete (laughs) scientifically accurate anatomical words, um, you know, enough information to answer their question. And then I'll ask, did that answer your question? And if they say yes, awesome, we move on. But because I'm a gynecologist and I've just written a book on consent and I'm starting a tech company that's dealing with sexual assault, you know, they have been in the rooms and or the car when phone calls have come in and they have heard things. And so I'm very open. You know, we talk about reproductive rights. We talk about all of these issues. And my 10-year-old, in fact, said, Mom, can I read this book? I said, well, it's really written for, you know, uh, kids ages 13 to 25, but you know, I, I, I know that you're aware of all of these issues and you're welcome to look at it. If you have any questions, come ask me. My daughter in fifth grade, they started sex ed and she came up to me one day and she said, I'm super excited. And I said, why? She goes, tomorrow we're going to learn about sex. Yeah. And I said, okay, so just so you know, this is kind of like my thing. <laughs> if you but they have, don't want to hear it from you. If yeah. you have any questions... You can always ask me. You know that. We've talked about stuff. And she goes, oh, I don't want to ask you. Yeah. I'm like, okay, go find out from a 17-year-old textbook that's heteronormative. And yeah. we had a huge kerfuffle at, at at our school because there are there were several kids who had gay parents. Mm. And, you know, the, the entire, all of the lessons, everything was, it's not about sex. It's about reproduction. That's right. Most sex ed is about two things, all fear-based. Yep. <laughs> uh, and then it's about pregnancy prevention and sexually transmitted infection. You know, dun, 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 dun. Like scary, scary, don't do it. You know, like <laughs> save yourself. It's not about pleasure. It's not about communication. Like we're failing. Yeah. We're failing. And so part of me writing this book is like, Let's talk about healthy expressions of sexuality that are not fear-based, that are not about reproduction and heteronormativity, that are about what sex really is for people, which is kind of a gradual discovery of one's identity and and pleasure and turn-ons. And, and for me, and particularly regarding girls, you know, they need to know their bodies and know what feels good so that they can then communicate that right. with a partner. So I, you know, the book is, I'm pretty clear up front. I'm like, this is not a book about masturbation. However, <laughs> I strongly believe that, you know, we need to be able to hold up a mirror, identify our anatomy, understand what's what and what feels good before we start, you know, being sexually active with others because how are we going to know what we want and what we don't want if we haven't kind of discovered what feels good to us first? Abstinence and fear-based sex education does not work. Clearly, in every single study, it is correlated with higher rates of teen pregnancies, unintended, and higher rates of sexually transmitted infections. So it's not that people aren't sexually active. They are sexually active, just with less information. Right. Yeah. If you don't teach your kids something, that doesn't mean they're not going to do it. That just means they're going to do it badly. Yeah. Yeah. Without being prepared, without being empowered. I know this is a little sensitive, but these uh, purity balls and abstinence pledges and things like that, those populations, they actually have higher rates of anal sex and sexually transmitted infections, and they're not prepared. Sex education is not mandatory in every state in this country. It's 24 out of 50 mandated, and and only 18 of those 24 require it to be scientifically accurate. That's what I was getting at. You're, they're allowed to have sex education, but they can talk about a stork. They can talk about balloons. Anything. They yeah. can talk about the Bible. Yeah. And only 11, I believe now, um, require that consent even be mentioned. So here we are in the Me Too movement where people are finally speaking about their stories, their past, their histories, their traumas uh, without this sense of shame and self-blame and, you know, Why do you think women carry shame for being victimized sexually? Oh, 
I mean, that's it's complex, but I think it goes back to that what we were talking about before. From the very earliest ages, the programming about how you are responsible for setting limits and boundaries, and so if those boundaries were were violated, you must have done something wrong. You know, you must have dressed overly provocative. You must have flirted. You must have given them mixed messages. It must actually be your fault. And we're getting those messages from so many places throughout our entire lives that uh, whether, you know, intellectually we even recognize that we hold those beliefs, they run so deep. Yeah. You know, and then add to that that people haven't been telling their stories or speaking out loud about it. So then you feel, oh, maybe I am the only one that this has happened to. And so that has been what's so incredible about the Me Too movement is now we're we're sharing our stories. And that was part of me wanting to incorporate the voices of actual teens and young adults. I wanted that peer-to-peer kind of sharing of, oh, that happened to me too. I, you know, I, I got drunk at a party and didn't remember what happened and I woke up with my pants off. Like, yeah. I, I want people to know that these are things that happen and we need to talk about them. And we need to learn from them. You know, I say in the book, consent is the only must have when it comes to partnered sex. Consent, that is bedrock foundation. So, as young women, we're, you know, we're told we're the gatekeepers. He's going to go as try as far as he wants and you have to stop. You have to stop. Then when we start to be sexually active, it's never about our own pleasure. Mm-hmm. You know, I read somewhere where it's about 10 years of having sex before women start to realize, oh, maybe there's some things that I want. Mm-hmm. And quite a few women never speak up. Yeah. And now I, I work with a lot of women in their 40s and 50s who have had horrible sex lives their entire lives. Yeah. Because basically, they've either not asked for what they wanted thought it wasn't their role to advocate or really commonly are afraid to ask for what they want because they think they're going to hurt their partner's feelings. I know. That's actually a huge part of this. Um, I'm going to call out my mother right now. (laughs) When I went off to that summer camp and she said, you know, just never say no to a boy who asks you to dance because, you know, he probably was feeling really nervous to ask you and you don't want to hurt his feelings. And I know she meant it from a good place of not wanting boys' feelings to be hurt. But when we are directly telling girls, just put your feelings, wants, and desires aside because it's your job to take care of the feelings of other people, that's a problem. And so as I was doing, you know, a lot of the the focus group research also for my my company, you know, it just kept coming up. Well, is there a way that you can kind of get out of a situation without having to directly reject the guy? But if someone came up to you and said, can I have all the money in your wallet? Mm -hmm. You would say, providing they don't have a gun, you would say, no, get away from me. Right. That's but right. if somebody says, can I touch your body in places that will be exciting to me and maybe awful for you? Yeah. All of a sudden, I have to worry about their feelings? Yeah. Well, there was an amazing article about what happens when women or girls reject men or boys. Unfortunately, when men are rejected, they tend to react negatively. So whether it's you know some kind of verbal retaliation calling her a slut to the friends, or they are more likely to get aggressive Mm -hmm. or even violent. You know, we know with intimate partner violence, you know, the time when she is most at risk is when she's leaving. So girls aren't wrong to feel this way. They, however, what we need to do is we need to change society and culture. We need to make sure that All genders are responsible for their own feelings. And so I talk about giving and receiving consent and non-consent. The way I say it in the book is a yes is not meaningful unless a no is an equally valid option without any negative consequences. And that that was kind of as clear as I could put it. Yeah. Because... um, 
if if you are uh, going to threaten, whether it's through some kind of social retaliatory action or something, she can't freely give her consent to you. Right. You know? That's right. So we all need to understand that. So we really... Need to start with the boys. Yes. Well, it's it's all. It's all sides of it. Boys need to be responsible for their own feelings, understand that it is not always their job role or expectation to be the pursuers, you know, or the the active, you know, aggressors or anything like that. And girls need to understand that, you know, they are completely empowered to decide what they want and don't want to do with their bodies. They are not responsible to take care of others' feelings. They are entitled to pleasure. They are entitled to fully autonomous decision-making at all points throughout an interaction and that they, you know, should feel empowered in their voices. How do you start this conversation with your kids? How do you say, okay, kids, sit down. We're going to talk about consent. How do you, how do you start that? Yeah, it's funny. So since the book has come out, I've had a number of conversations with parents who ask exactly that question. And what I say in response is, you need to start it with yourself. What do you mean? (laughs) The adults. So it's very hard to teach something that you yourself haven't fully integrated. It's impossible, in fact. And so many adults are so uncomfortable having these conversations even, you know, amongst each other with their partners, it, how on earth do they think they're going to have a conversation with, you know, a, a teenager without completely transmitting this discomfort, this, you know, so we need to start talking as adults and, and looking at our own lives, our own actions. And then we need to model that. I mean, I'm a huge believer that kids are the most perceptive, sensitive, sponges to everything, words, actions, and energy. And they will see you acting with empowered autonomy in your own life, and they will model that. Yeah, but you know what I think you've just done? It, mm-hmm. I, women, we're, all, we're just told day after day all the new things on our list. Oh. So now... Now you also have to... So now it's like, <laughs> shit, I want to talk to my kids about consent. I want to be a responsible parent. I, this is very important. Yeah. But now you're saying, I got to fix my own shit first. And all these things that I've been basically stuffing down for the last 20 years in my own marriage, I got to fix all that before I can talk to my kids? Or just buy the book for them. <laughs> <laughs> One or the other. One or the other. <laughs> well, can't you do both? Yes. You do no, it all. No, seriously. So it's like, yes. not that we're looking for a quick fix, but this is a big ask. A lot of parents are going to say, I want to do this. I want to get my kids started off on the right foot. Mm-hmm. I want to start having this conversation, but maybe I'm not ready to do it for myself. Maybe I'm not ready to work on that part of my life, but I really, I got to get this going now. Yeah. I can't, I can't cook their dinner and also fix my own dinner at the same time if we're in two separate kitchens. You know, I I hope that in this moment, this really exciting moment in our history, um, that more women are starting to explore the full range of just their being on this planet, you know, and sexuality can be a huge and wonderful part of that. And, And for men too. I mean, I want fathers to be having these conversations with their sons and daughters. Of course. You know, this should not just be in the realm of like yet another mom's responsibility, emotional labor. Dads, get in there, you know, and talk to your sons about like how they don't always have to see how far they can get. You know, let's, let's shake up some of these expectations. Are you hearing back from parents about the book? Are they saying, what are they saying to you? You know, I I have been getting some amazing feedback, and uh, I think uh, parents are grateful that, you know, they can just kind of take the book and say, hey, I just, you know, got you this thing, just putting it here on your desk, or it's on your bookshelf, read it, don't read it, but I just wanted you to have it, you know, and it takes some pressure off, and it gives uh, teens, you know, the agency to... Uh, know that there's a resource there. Yeah. So you have a, a passage. You have a passage in your book, and it says, "If having an open conversation about sexual health with a doctor makes you feel uncomfortable, you probably shouldn't be engaging in sexual activities." So this again is girls, I assume, or female-bodied people going to get birth control, or maybe they're too nervous and they can't do it. And you're saying, if you can't do that, then you're not ready to 
be engaging in sex. Yeah, might not be. I mean, everything in here, I hope the tone is not, you know, you should do this or you should not do that, but more like um, maybe you need to do a little bit more exploration and maturing before, you know, you're trying to have that conversation with another teenager. Right. This might feel better if you think about these things first. Right. I also, just to bring it back, because you said the thing about female-bodied people, you know, I think it's really wrong and unfair that there isn't the equivalent of the first GYN appointment for young girls, like a urology appointment for young boys. Sure. To talk to a doctor about their penis, about erections, about premature ejaculation, about condoms, about, you know, all of those things. I think that that would be really helpful. Um, and when my son gets to that age, you know, uh, I know a great urologist, you know, I, I will, I will make that appointment and the doctors can be like, you're the first, you know, 13 year old boy that's ever come into my, you know, but, uh, I, I just think that that's what we need is boys taking as much responsibility for the whole, the mechanics and the birth control. I mean, why should that be the girl's responsibility? Right. You know? Because, well, because the girl basically pays the ultimate price if it doesn't work. Unfortunately. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so this is a line that I saw, I saw from your book. And again, I have a 13-year-old daughter. I'm a very open-minded person, but I'm still a little terrified. Okay. And I really like this line you wrote. Um Everyone you choose to gift with access to your sexuality should treasure that gift and take every precaution to honor and respect your wishes at all times. I mean, that to me says it all. Thank you. Yeah, I think if you can empower your children to negotiate consent, you can empower them to negotiate anything in their life moving forward. I so agree. Dr. Jennifer Lang, and the book is called Consent. Click in my notes below and you can find out how to order it on Amazon or you can just order it on Amazon. You don't need to find out from me. How hard could that be? It's not always great when you fornicate. Screw confession. This is how the story goes. I am in a new relationship with a pretty hot guy and I had a trip planned to go to Yellowstone Park. And he ended up coming with me kind of at the last minute. And, you know, we're in the throes of new relationship romance. We're kind of inseparable and having lots of fun, great sex and still getting to know each other. So we had we had spent a day, I think this was our first day in Yellowstone. And now we are checking into our room. And it turns out we got the last room in this hotel. And it was also a very sexy handicap suite which meant there were handrails all over the bathroom and crinkly plastic sheets, you know, you could hear when you got on the bed. And so we had dinner and came back and we're having uh, some romance and we're making out and now we're in the throes of sex and I'm on my back on this big king size bed. And in, you know, a moment of pleasure, I reach back behind me and I, my fingers curl around this massive carved wooden headboard that's above the bed. And at the moment of climax, apparently I, <laughs> I pulled on this thing and the entire massive headboard came crashing down. And keep in mind, he is still inside of me. And now we are laughing hysterically. And then the next thing that happened from the laughter was... I farted and then I actually peed on him a little bit. It's, you know, it's a brand new relationship and this, the, we're getting to know each other. And uh, in that moment, he looked at me and he said, you are a multimedia extravaganza. <laughs> and, and fortunately, uh, the relationship continued for uh, five years after that. So it wasn't, thankfully, it wasn't a deal breaker, but... What a way to start, right? <laughs> Thank you so much for that story. That story was actually emailed to me by a listener. And if you have a screw confession, you probably do. Uh, email me at info at sexedthemusical.com to find out how to submit it. It's very simple. And uh, chances are you might be into submission. <laughs> I'm sorry. I had to say that. I'd like to thank my guest today, Dr. Jennifer Lang. Of course, Sex Ed the Musical is produced by Mindy Miller, edited by Carl T. Wright. 
creative consultant, Jackie Morgan McDougall, and I'm your host, Wendy Miller. As always, if you like the show, please comment below. To find out more, go to sexedthemusical.com. Sex Ed, Sex Ed, what's happening in your bed? Yeah, Sex Ed, the musical.